Hey there, welcome back to the big board. I thought I'd give you a little bit of a rundown from Polybius on the Battle of Raphia. And I thought we'd start out at the equivalent of chapter 79 in the fifth book uh, from Polybius. And we're going to just read some of the commentary that's in here, see what Polybius saw, and kind of go from there when we look at the battle we can compare. So, chapter 79, by the beginning of the spring, Antiochus and Ptolemy had completed their preparations and were determined on deciding the fate of the Syrian expedition by a battle. Ptolemy had started out from Alexandria with an army of 70,000 foot and 5,000 horse with about 73 elephants. And Antiochus, upon learning his advance, concentrated his forces, which, considered, which uh, consisted of light-armed troops of about 5,000 in number, 10,000 selected from every part of the kingdom and armed in the Macedonian manner, uh, most of them with silver shields, the phalanx was 20,000 strong and was under the command of a couple of generals. <laughs> mm. uh, there were Persian bowmen and slingers, uh, up to 2,000 of them, with 2,000 Thracians, uh, who were commanded by Menedemus. Antiochus also had 1,500 Cretan archers, I'm guessing they were, and 1,000 Neocretans. With these, uh, no fewer than 500 Lydian javelineers and a thousand Cardaces were uh, under the command of a Gaul a general. The cavalry numbered 6,000, 4,000 of them being commanded by Antipater, uh, the king's nephew, and the rest by Themosian, Themison. The whole army consisted of about 62,000 foot, 6,000 horse, and 102 elephants. Right, so now we're going to roll down a little bit further from uh, chapter so they camped uh, outside of Rafia, 50 stades or stades from uh, Rafia, which is the first town in the, of the, uh, this particular region in Syria. Uh, Antiochus, Antiochus was approaching at the same time with his army, and after reaching Gaza, he rested his forces there and continued to advance slowly. Well, uh, there is one little side note in uh, chapter 81, which is interesting, and we'll touch on it briefly. Uh, basically, Theodotus made a daring attempt uh, to uh, attempt to assassinate Ptolemy. Unfortunately, he was familiar with uh, Ptolemy's uh, habits and tastes, and he entered the camp at early at dawn, uh, where it was too, date f too dark for his face to be recognized. There was nothing to attract his attention in his dress and general appearance. <laughs> Uh, he had uh, noticed in, on previous days the position of the king's tent, and as the skirmishers had come up quite near to the camp, he uh, decided that he was going to make a, a bolt for it and try and attempt to assassinate the king. Now, uh, he failed to find the king, uh, who was in the habit of resting outside of the principal, uh, of the principal and official tent, but after wounding two of those who slept there and killing the king's physician, uh, Theodorus actually returned to safety of his own camp. So, then we carry on with chapter 82. It wasn't until five days later that both decided to resolve the matters by battle. The moment that Ptolemy began to move his army out of camp and Antiochus followed suit, and both of them placed the phalanxes of the picked troops and armed in the Macedonian fashion, confronting each other in the center. Ptolemy, uh, uh, Ptolemy's two wings were formed as follows. Polycrates, with his cavalry, held the extreme left wing, and between him and the phalanx stood the first of the Cretans, next, next the cavalry, then the royal guard, then the Peltists and the Socrates. These latter being, these latter being uh, next to the Libyans, who were armed in the Macedonian manner also. On the extreme right wing was the rest of the cavalry, and, to, and on uh, the generals left there, the Gauls and Thracians, and next to them were the Phocidas, P-H-O-X-I-D-A-S, with his Greek mercenaries in immediate contact with the Egyptian phalanx. Of the elephants, 40 were posted to the left where Ptolemy himself was about to fight, and the remaining 33 in front of the mercenary cavalry on the right wing. Antiochus placed 60 of his elephants under the command of his foster brother Philip in front of his right wing, uh, where he was uh, to fight in person against Ptolemy. Behind the elephants, he posted 2,000 horse on Antipater and 2,000 more at an angle with them. 
next to the cavalry facing the front, next to the next to the cavalry facing the front, he placed the Cretans, uh, the mercenaries from Greece, and next to these five thousand armed in the Macedonian fashion. Uh, let's see. On his extreme left, he posted two thousand horse. Next to those, the Cardassians and Lydian Javlaniers, then 3,000 light armed troops under Mendemus or Menedemus. After those, there was the various, some various tribes and the Arabs, and then uh, the Phalanx. He placed the remainder of his elephants on the left wing. Chapter 83 The armies have been drawn up in this fashion. Both the kings rode along the line, accompanied by their officers and friends, and addressed the soldiers. As they relied chiefly on the phalanx, it was to these troops that they made the most earnest appeal. And Ptolemy being supported by Andromachus and others, and his sister Arasone, 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 uh, let's see here, I think we shall skip that little section there. The substance of the address was on both sides very similar. For neither king could recite any glorious or generally recognized achievement of his own, so that it was by reminding the troops of the glorious deeds of their ancestors that they attempted to inspire them with spirit and courage. They laid the greatest uh, stress, however, on the rewards which might be expected to be bestowed in the future, and urged and exhorted both of the leaders in particular, and exhorted both the leaders in particular, and all those who were about to be engaged in general to bear themselves, therefore, like gallant men into the coming battle. <clears throat> so with these or similar words spoken either by themselves or by the interpreters, they rode along the line. It's interesting that they mentioned interpreters there. 84. Okay, so it looks like uh, both leaders end up at their uh, respective ends of the battlefield. They're both at the same end of the battlefield. Uh, they get the signal for battle and, and brought the elephants first into action. A few only of Ptolemy's elephants ventured uh, to close with those of the enemy, and now the men in the towers on the back of these beasts made a gallant fight of it, striking with their spikes, with their pikes at close quarters and wounding each other, while the elephants themselves fought still better, putting forth their whole strength and meeting forehead to forehead. The way in which these animals fight, fight is as follows. With their tusks firmly interlocked, they shove with all their might, each trying to force the other to give ground, until the one who proves strongest pushes aside the other's trunk. And then, when he has at once made, when he has once made him turn and has him in the flank, he gores him with his tusks as a bull does with his horns. Most of Tommy's elephants, however, declined the combat, as is the habit of African elephants. For unable to stand the smell and trumpeting of the Indian elephants, and terrified, I suppose, also by their great size and strength, they once turn tail and take to flight before they got near them. This is what happened to the present on the present occasion, and when Tommy's elephants were thus thrown into confusion and driven back on their own lines, Tommy's guard gave way under the pressure of the animals. Meanwhile, Antiochus and his cavalry, riding past the flank of the elephants on the outside, attacked Polycrates and the cavalry under his command. While at the same time, on the other side of the elephants, the Greek mercenaries near next to the phalanx fell upon Tommy's peltists and drove them back. Their ranks having been already thrown into confusion by the elephants, thus the whole of Tommy's left wing was hard-pressed and in retreat. Chapter 85 the Ecucrates, who commanded the right wing at first, waited for the rest, the result of the engagement between the other wings. But when he saw the cloud of dust being carried in his direction, and their own elephants not even daring to approach those of the enemy, he ordered uh, Phocidas with the mercenaries from Greece to attack the hostile force in his front, while he himself, with his cavalry and division immediately behind the elephants, moving off the field and around the enemy's flank avoided the onset of the animals and speedily put to flight the cavalry of the enemy, charging them both in the flank and the rear. Uh, the men he had ordered to advance with, uh, met with the same success. For charging the Arabs and the Medes, they forced them into a headlong flight. Antiochus' right wing then was victorious, while his left wing was being worsted in the manner I have described. Meanwhile, the phalanxes, stripped of their <coughs> wings, remained intact in the middle of the plain, swayed alternatively by hope and fear. Antiochus, 
was still preoccupied in pursuing his advantage on the right wing. But Tommy, having retired under the shelter of the phalanx, suddenly uh, came forward and showed himself to his troops, causing consternation among the enemy and inspired his own men with increased alacrity and spirit. Lowering their pikes, therefore, the phalanx under Andromachus and Sosibius advanced to the charge. For a short time, they, the picked Syrian troops resisted, but those under Nicarus quickly turned and fled. Antiochus, at all this time, being still young and inexperienced, and supposing from his own success that his army was victorious in other parts of the field too, was following up the fugitives. But at length, and on one of his older officers calling his attention to the fact that the cloud of dust was moving from the phalanx towards his own camp, he realized what had happened, and attempted to return to the battlefield with his horse guards. But finding that his whole army had taken to flight, he retired to Raphia <clears throat> in the confident belief that as far as it depended on himself, he had won the battle, but had suffered this disaster owing to the base cowardice of the rest. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, Tommy, having uh, obtained a decisive victory by his phalanx and having killed many of the enemy in the pursuit of the uh, by the hands of the cavalry and mercenaries on his right wing, retired and spent the night in his former camp. Next day, after picking up and burying his own dead and despoiling those of the enemy, he broke up his camp and advanced on Raphia. And I think that is where uh, I will leave it off and let you know that uh, Antiochus came to terms with Ptolemy and they agreed on a truce for a year. So it was a decisive battle, but not one that was going to provide any lasting peace. <clears throat> 